Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, and I invite you to stand if you're able. I'll be reading from the second chapter, verses 41 through 51. Each year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to their custom. After the festival was over, they were returning home, but the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't know it, supposing that he was among the, Brit, the band of travelers. They journeyed on for a full day while looking for him among their family and friends. When they didn't find Jesus, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and putting questions to them. Everyone who heard him was amazed by his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were shocked. His mother said, child, why have you treated us like this? Listen, your father and I have been worried. We've been looking for you. Jesus replied, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother cherished every word in her heart. Jesus matured in wisdom and years and in favor with God and with people. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you to pray with me. Dear Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day and always. We pray this in faith in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So in this sermon series, we've been following uh, Adam Hamilton's book, and I seem to lose it every time I get up here. And it's not a silent night, and uh, we've been following this on Bible study. And if you haven't been coming to Bible study, you've been missing the best Bible study ever. So I'll give you a little bit of guilt there, but uh, it's not too late. There's, um, the, the reading for this week is in the back. And uh, it's not too late, because it kind of picks up each week. So we started at the end of Mary's life two weeks ago. Last week, we were at the cross and the resurrection, and we tied together how the resurrection and the death of Jesus uh, paid for our sins and atoned, you know, provided that atonement for us so that we can be one with God again. But we, we looked at it from the perspective of what Mary was going through at the cross, And this week, we stay with that perspective of what Mary is going through. But now, we're back another um, 18 years, if I got my math right. Uh, Jesus was, no, it's it's, uh, 21 years. Yeah, it's 21 years. Actually, I wrote it down. I should check my card. We're looking at the year 12, and Jesus was 12 years old. And Mary would have been about 28 years old at that point, to give you a picture of, you know, who she would have been at the timing of this. Now, there's some really neat things about this passage that, um, you know, is important to point out. Um, It's the only story in the Bible of Jesus' childhood. Nowhere else in any of the four Gospels do we hear of Jesus as a childhood. This is the one and only story, the one accounting of Jesus as a child. The second thing to note about this is this is the last we ever hear of Joseph. So the scholars believe that somewhere between today's reading... And Jesus, when he was age 30 and began his ministry, somewhere in that time span, Joseph Joseph passed away. There's no other mention of him in the Bible. And it's also the earliest recorded words of Jesus. All of that is tied up into that scripture that I just read to you today. Now, when you think about this, this story would have had to have been told by Mary. It's, it's It's a really passionate moment at Bible study on Tuesday night. I asked the people to, uh, that were there to express a time when their children did something that absolutely exasperated them or embarrassed them or, you know, created some moment of, of passion, like, what were you thinking, like Mary was? And, and, you know, we shared around the table because we all have them. If you've got kids, if you've got grandkids, you've got stories, right? Some of those stories were we're tell, and some of those stories, man, we'll go to the grave. We're not ever telling those stories, right? But we all have those stories. I love the story of your niece, though. You got to ask Eric at coffee hour about what he did to his niece. Poor girl. <laughs> but 
you know, picture yourself like this. When, when Diane and I were young parents, um, Daniel, the one sitting in the back there, he was in first or second grade, and we went on a trip to, to Bar Harbor, Maine, and it was in the middle of the summer, and Bar Harbor, Maine is kind of a tourist trap in the middle of the summer. It's nice other times of the year, but we went into this restaurant. It's called EpiSub, and they make the best subs anywhere that you'll ever get any place. And we all walk in there, and we look up at the menu, and we're figuring out what we need. I've got Joshua in my backpack, and Andrew's in Diane's toe, I guess. And we say, Daniel, what do you want? Daniel, Daniel, what do you want? He's gone, right? So we go outside the store. There's no Daniel outside the store. We go back inside the store. There's no Daniel in the this, in this store. Diane goes and checks the bathroom. Daniel's nowhere, you know? So now you have that, oh, my God, what are we going to do, you know? So we start looking for Dan and splitting up the best we can. And after maybe 10 minutes, it's like, go to the police. So Diane walks to the police station, which is about two blocks away. And she says, we got this missing kid. And I'm frantically searching the town at this point. And, you know, Diane is in a police car. You got the cops of Bar Harbor going around. The fire department is looking for Daniel. And, you know, all of these people that we could possibly get are looking for Daniel. And, you know, here there's just hundreds and hundreds of people walking and there's traffic all over the place. And, you know, after about an hour of this, I was absolutely distraught. And I just fell to my knees and I said, dear Lord God, I, do, I need your help. I don't know what to do. And praise God, he said, go back. So I went back to the store, you know, the, the epi sub place where Daniel was missing, and, and lo and behold, here's this panicked little first grader standing there, nervous but brave as could be, and when he, we saw each other, he just cried and ran over to me and hugged me, and, you know, I walked him, when, when I met with him, I, I said, you know, what were you doing? Where were you? And, you know, I, I was so angry with him and at the same time so happy that I found him. You know, I really relate to what Mary went through here. Uh, so I walked them back up to the police station, and, uh, you know, they said, is that the missing one? And I'm like, yeah, that's the missing one. All right. Well, knowing Daniel and his affinity towards electronics, when we all went in to look at the menu, Daniel went back to look at the arcade and, you know, those machines where you drive cars? That's where he was in. So every time we'd look, you couldn't see him because he's in there driving cars. He was in the store the whole time, you know. But now picture this in Mary's story, in Joseph's story. They traveled to Jerusalem once a year for the Passover meal, and they made their sacrifices at the temple. As Remember last week's reading when they met Simeon and Anna, right? They're coming home from that now. There's some 300,000 people extra in Jerusalem, plus the, the general population, they would have traveled with a whole band of people, people they knew from their town of Nazareth and, you know, some family members and whatnot. But they would have been traveling for three or four days by feet and with their livestock and with their, you know, their year and all that stuff that you would need to camp out in the desert. They travel a whole day's journey. Imagine how far we can travel today in a whole day, right? We can go four, five, six hundred miles in a day. And imagine getting to the point where you're going to spend the night and looking at your spouse and saying, well, where's Daniel? Right? That's what happened here. They were a whole day's journey away from Jerusalem. So you can only imagine that during the cover of night, they, they you know, hurried back to Jerusalem, and then they go to all the houses where you know, they, they might have stayed. They go to everybody they, they know and everybody they don't know. They don't find him. They start going to the hospitals. They don't find him. They start going even to the morgue. They don't find him. It takes three days to find him. You know, there's parents that lose their children, and, you know, sometimes those endings aren't happy. It's unimaginable. I can't even imagine what they go through. You know, I suffered that hour, and that was agonizing. I can't imagine what, you know, you go through after three days or longer. But that's how upset Mary and Joseph have gotten to the point where they find Jesus happy as could be, sitting in the temple. Right. What's Mary's first reaction, right? What was her word? You know, I, I made the mistake of reading a different translation all week, so I've got the words messed up in my head. 
child, where or why have you treated us like this, right? They were shocked. That's a natural reaction, right? You want to beat them and hug them all in the same in the same moment because there's just so much emotion flowing through you. But here, here's where you have to picture this. She didn't just find her lost child. She found him sitting down. Now, you know, our custom is for the preacher to stand up, you know, usually up in a high pulpit and look down. You know, I stand and pace all over the church and make you guys crazy. But the, the custom was for the man in authority to be sitting down. So you have to picture Jesus like, like he is up there, and it was usually a marble chair, sitting in that marble chair, speaking from a, a, a point of authority. And the people were astonished. They were amazed and they were astounded. So that just adds to their finding Jesus. You know, not only did they find him, but they found him sitting there teaching as, as a member of authority, and they were absolutely amazed and astounded. Now, Adam Hamilton does this in his video, and I'll try and do it justice. You know, on this side, you have Mary and Joseph. Jesus, you know, or, or don't you know that your mother and father have been looking for you? And then, you know, Jesus is over here. Well, would you not know I'd be in my father's house? You know, picture that again. Jesus, don't you know we were, you, you and your father, we were looking for you. And here's Jesus, did you not know that I was in your father's house, my father's house? Think about Joseph at that moment, right? That had to hurt, that had to sting. You know, G Joseph, no doubt, when you live with a child for 12 years, you love him as your own. But here's Jesus proclaiming, my father is the heavenly father. It wasn't dishing Joseph, but yet he was claiming God as his own. And Jesus does, you know, Jesus is clearly doing that, claiming who he is in this, in this instant in time at the age of 12 years old. And in Mary, you know, Mary maybe perhaps goes back to the angel Gabriel when Gabriel told her that she would be blessed with carrying this child and that the father would be the earth, you know, the heavenly father, not, not the earthly father. I want to go back to the amazed part. In, uh, in the Greek, and remember, the New Testament was originally printed in Greek. There's uh, words like expleso and thambeo and existemi, and they all mean utterly and completely astonished. They mean amazed, and they, they, they mean like in our language, blown away, you know, absolutely like nothing we've ever thought, nothing we could possibly conceive or, or picture or, or put a, you know, an explanation around. Just completely and utterly astounded. That's what the people in that temple, as I said, were witnessing of Jesus Christ. Now, that word astonished and amazed, and, and those Greek words were used 11 times in Matthew, 10 times in Mark, 13 times in Luke, and six times in John, because that was usually how people reacted when they encountered Jesus, when they encountered his teachings, or when they witnessed his miracles, or maybe you know, had a physical healing themselves. It was like nothing they could possibly experience before or even explain. And you know, I can relate to that because that started at the age of 12 for Jesus even. But for me, when I encountered Christ and the night that I turned my life over to Christ, it was 19 years ago. And I was on a walk to Emmaus weekend. And I saw Christ and I actually saw Christ in the face of the people that were at the, the church service on one of the evening uh, uh, celebrations. I actually saw Christ on the face of the men and women. I was astounded. I was amazed. I was blown away. I had never in my life to that point realized that Christ lives in people the way he does until I saw him on the faces of those people. Now, I know that's hard for you guys to relate because 
you know, you haven't had that experience, but that's how Christ came to me. And that's when I turned my life over to Christ that night. You know, I came up to the altar with the table leader and one of the clergy members, and I turned my life over to Christ that night because I was so amazed, I was so astonished, and I was so blown away by that experience that it changed my life. It warmed my heart, and I've never looked back. You know, since that time, I've witnessed that in others. I've had the great privilege of being with others when they have, you know, had a similar circumstance. And, you know, Christ comes to us all different ways. As unique as each and every one of us are, Christ comes to us as unique and different as every one of us are. He never comes to any of us both the same way. But he's still doing it today. And people are still amazed and still astonished and still astounded by the way that they encounter Christ. Many times when they least expect it, many times when they think they least, they least need it even. And that's what the Christmas Advent is all about. Advent means something's coming. Right? Remember we started out with that? Something is coming. That's what Advent means. It means we're waiting for something to